Real Time 1960s presents Evening Report, a complete roundup of today's news with Joe Rubenstein. Good evening. In Washington, D.C. police get ready for a massive civil rights demonstration. In Saigon, government forces crack down on Buddhists. In Switzerland, Richard Nixon defends Barry Goldwater. Marlon Brando is hospitalized. Floyd Patterson needs a miracle. Those are the headlines, the details after this message. Maybe you've noticed the way owners show a special kind of respect for their new Mercury Comets. And why not? Doesn't Comet scrimp and save for them on every gallon of regular? And now, Comet goes without an oil change for 6,000 miles. Why, Comet even adjusts its own brakes, keeps its enamel finish sparkling clean, and just soap and water stays just as beautiful and stylish as the day it was new. No wonder more and more people with heads on their shoulders are seen driving away a new 63 Mercury Comet. In Washington Thursday, Negro leaders of an upcoming civil rights march conferred with D.C. police officials on plans for what the demonstration's organizers are calling a mass appeal to the conscience of America. A D.C. police spokesman said that orderly demonstrators would be welcomed on August 28th. The march, which will be held at the Lincoln Memorial, is expected to bring at least 100,000 persons from 28 cities. At today's press conference, President Kennedy was asked for his views on the forthcoming demonstration. Uh, Do you find that the demonstrations which are taking place uh, are a handicap uh, to you, Uh, specifically the Washington March in August? Do you think that this will... No, I think that the way that the Washington March is now developed, which is a peaceful assembly calling for a redress of grievances, the cooperation with the police, every evidence that it's going to be peaceful. I think that's in the great tradition. I'll look forward to being here. I'm sure members of Congress will be here. Anyone who, we want citizens to come to Washington if they feel that they're not having their their rights uh, expressed. But of course, arrangements have been made to make this responsible and peaceful. This is not a march on the Capitol. Now, there are other places, of course, where the demonstrations, where there are grievances, but where the demonstrations get caught up in a cycle. And uh, we've got it in Cambridge, Maryland, where there's no peace. They've almost lost sight of what the demonstration's about. You've got 400 National Guardsmen there. Now, I'm concerned about those uh, demonstrations. I think they go beyond information, they go beyond protest, and they get into a very bad uh, situation where you get violence, and I think the cause of advancing equal opportunities only loses. So I have warned against uh, demonstrations which could lead to riots, demonstrations which could lead to bloodshed, and I warn now against it. Some of the people, however, who keep talking about demonstrations never talk about the problem of redressing grievances. I would hope that along with a cessation of the kinds of demonstrations that would lead to rioting, that people would also do something about the grievances. You just can't tell people don't protest, but on the other hand, we're not going to let you come into a store or a restaurant. Seems to me it's a two-way street. The president was asked to respond to charges by Alabama Governor George Wallace and Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett that the civil rights movement was communist-inspired. Well, the fact of the matter is that the communists uh, attempt to uh, uh, worm their way into every uh, movement, and particularly to uh, worm their way into those uh, movements where there's trouble. I would think that uh, the few, relatively few remaining communists in the United States, and they are very few, I would think that they would attempt to uh, take advantage of whatever difficulties that uh, may arise in the United States. But uh, I must say that uh, we uh, look into this matter with a good deal of care, We have no evidence that uh, any of the leaders of the civil rights movements in the United States are communists, uh, have no evidence that the demonstrations are communist-inspired. There may be occasions when a communist uh, takes part in a demonstration. We can't prevent that, but uh, I think it's uh, a convenient uh, scapegoat to suggest that all the difficulties are communist, and if the communist uh, movement would only disappear, that uh, we would uh, end this. The fact of the matter is... uh, It's easy. It's easy to blame it on the authorities in Washington. It's easy to blame it on the attorney general or the president and say if they would just stop talking about these things, the problem would go away. The way to make the problem go away, in my opinion, is to provide for a redress of grievances. On Monday, Governor Wallace appeared before the Senate Commerce Committee, which has been holding hearings on the president's proposed civil rights bill. Mr. Wallace told the senators, quote, If you intend to pass this bill, prepare to withdraw all our troops from Berlin, Vietnam, and the rest of the world, because they will be needed to police America, unquote. 
Last week, Dr. Martin Luther King appeared on Press Conference USA, a television program distributed internationally by the U.S. Information Agency. The panel of correspondents included George Aninful, U.N. correspondent for the Ghana News Agency, William Workman, associate editor of the state newspaper in South Carolina, and T.V. Parasaram, Washington correspondent for the Indian Express newspaper. Mr. Workman asked Dr. King if he was in favor of denying a business proprietor the right to select that portion of the public to which he wants to cater. Yes, if it's on the basis of race. I think he ought to have the right to keep drunk people out. I think he ought to have the right to keep people who are not uh, in the proper disposition as far as their manners are concerned. But I do not think any proprietor should have the right to deny a person uh, access to the facilities of his particular business because of race. I think a businessman should have rights, but he must also see that business is not only a right, it is a privilege and responsibility. The South Carolinian followed up by asking Dr. King whether he would find it acceptable if a proprietor who offered integrated service were to lose his white patronage and go out of business. More than 275 cities in the South have integrated their lunch counters and other uh, facilities since 1960. And on the whole, these businesses have increased in terms of their income and I think uh, this will continue to be true. Uh, but I do not think that one should uh, deny service to members of another race because there are some recalcitrant individuals who threaten to withdraw their services if the facilities are integrated. Mr. Aninful referenced a letter Dr. King had written on April 16th in a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama. The letter was a reply to eight white clergymen who had criticized Dr. King's methods. Mr. Aninful asked Dr. King to explain what role the church should play in the civil rights movement. Uh, at this point, I think the church has failed Christ uh, miserably. And uh, we must face the tragic fact that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, when thousands of Christians all over the United States stand to sing, In Christ there is no East or West, uh, we stand in the most segregated hour of America. Uh, I think uh, this is appalling. On the other hand, I think I must say that some very encouraging things have developed within the last few weeks. The National Council of Churches came out just uh, three weeks ago, uh, with a very strong statement calling not only for an end to segregation, but calling for its uh, various denominations and ministers to participate in demonstrations and direct action programs to end segregation. Uh, the same thing has developed uh, within the Roman Catholic Church, and very strong pronouncements have come from the various rabbinical councils. Many of the rabbis have come out so that uh, I see a new development in the church, which is uh, a very significant development, and to my mind, a new beacon light of hope. And I think the church now is moving on in the way that it should move, and it is making its witness clear. Finally, Mr. Aninful, after noting that President Kennedy's civil rights bill faced an uphill fight, asked Dr. King what action he proposed if the bill were defeated, and if he anticipated working more closely in that case with other separate Negro movements. There will be, I'm sure, filibuster, and we will definitely protest this. We will lobby in Washington seeking to get congressmen uh, senators to stand up in a very firm, forthright manner with a determination to see this bill through. We plan to have a march on Washington on the 28th of August, at which time we will take a stand, letting the nation and the world know that we are determined to see civil rights legislation. Uh, beyond this, we will have to wait it out and see what happens. In Saigon today, South Vietnamese government forces and police cracked down violently on a Buddhist demonstration. American security officers witnessed what they called deliberate police brutality that shocked and disgusted them. 
Riot police, plainclothesmen, and troops used clubs, rifle butts, and boots in breaking up a march by more than 1,000 Buddhists, over 100 of whom were arrested. During the crackdown, one policeman turned to American newsmen and said, quote, That's what happens when there's too much liberty, unquote. After the crackdown, all Buddhist pagodas in Saigon were sealed off with barbed wire. At today's press conference, President Kennedy was asked if the Buddhist crisis in South Vietnam was impeding U.S. efforts to assist in President No Dinh Diem's war against the communist Viet Cong. I think it has. I think it's unfortunate that this dispute has arisen at a very time when the military struggle has been going better than it's been going in many months. I would hope that some solution could be reached because uh, we've invested a tremendous amount of effort and it's going quite well. I do realize, of course, and we all have to realize that Vietnam has been in war for 20 years. Japanese came in, the uh, war with the French, the uh, Civil War, which has gone on for 10 years. This is very difficult uh, for any society to stand this. And it's a uh, country which has got a good many problems. It's divided. Uh, there's a guerrilla activity, murder, and all the rest. Compounding this, however, now is a religious dispute. I would hope this would be settled because we want to see a stable government there carrying on a struggle to maintain its national independence. We believe strongly in that. We're not going to withdraw from that effort. In my opinion, for us to withdraw from that effort would mean a collapse not only of South Vietnam, but Southeast Asia. So we're going to stay there. We hope with the great effort, which is being carried by the Vietnamese themselves, and they've been in this field a long time, a lot longer than we have, and with a good deal more deaths and casualties, that uh, behind this military shield put up by the Vietnamese people, they can reach an agreement on the civil disturbances. That's our hope. That's our effort. That's, we're bringing our influence to bear. The decision is finally theirs. But I think that before we render too harsh a judgment on the people, we should realize that uh, they've gone through a harder time than we've had to go through. In Saigon tonight, sources indicated that Buddhist demonstrations would continue and that more Buddhists might commit suicide in protest. I'll have more news for you after this message. Your cigarettes not tasting cool enough Till you come up to Cools With rich tobaccos, Cools white filter Extra coolness too Discover extra coolness in your smoke Let Cools come through for you You'll be smoking cools all the time once you come up to cool. Come up to cool for the most refreshing coolness you can get in any cigarette. Smoke cool. Filter kings. Here again, Joe Rubenstein. In Switzerland yesterday, former Vice President Richard Nixon said that while the extreme right wing could hurt Republicans in next year's elections, he did not think it would gain control of the GOP, stating, quote, It's true that the nuts, or the kooks as we call them, can make plenty of trouble for us as they did for me in California. The party's right wing is potent, noisy, and well-financed. But I do not think they will dominate the convention next year, unquote. Mr. Nixon's remarks followed a blistering statement issued Sunday by Republican Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York, a statement clearly aimed at Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona, the current frontrunner for the Republican presidential nomination. In the statement, Mr. Rockefeller said he was, quote, deeply disturbed by the ruthless, roughshod intimidation and tactics of totalitarianism, unquote, at the convention of the Young Republican National Federation last month in San Francisco. Senator Goldwater was the convention's hero and its closing speaker. The Republican Party, Mr. Rockefeller said, would destroy itself if it engaged in a far right-wing campaign strategy because it would alienate Negroes, other minority groups, the industrial states of the North, and the big cities. Yesterday, Mr. Nixon said he did not consider Senator Goldwater to be an extremist. He added that some extreme right-wingers regard Mr. Goldwater as too liberal. Meanwhile, at today's press conference, President Kennedy was asked to respond to a recent attack on his administration by the Republican National Committee. Uh, Mr. President, in the 1960 campaign, you used to say that it was time for America to get moving again. Do you think it is moving? And if so, how and where? The reason I ask you the question, Mr. President, is that the Republican National Committee recently uh, adopted a resolution saying you were pretty much of a failure. <laughs> I'm sure it was passed uh, unanimously. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, 
I think that uh, <laughs> I think that uh, we have made uh, significant progress on the economic front in the uh, increase in our gross national product, nearly $90 billion in a 25 percent increase in profits, in uh, farm income uh, up 10 percent, and all the rest. I think those statistics are available, they're obvious, and uh, I think they indicate that the United States has made substantial progress. The only thing is the United States has to move very fast to even stand still. We're going to have to find in the next decade 22 million jobs to take care of those coming into the labor market and those who are eliminated by technological gains. But we've been attempting to do something about the problem. In our tax program, in our various economic and legislative proposals, we've attempted to deal with some of the economic problems facing the country. I must say that I found a scarcity of uh, useful uh, resolutions coming out of the source which you named dealing with this problem of unemployment, tax revision, tax reform, minimum wage, social security, trade expansion, all these are areas where we've taken some action, but I'm not satisfied at all. I think we have to go a good deal further. Unemployment is still too high, and it's particularly concentrated among the unskilled, which is the hard core, and among those who are structurally unemployed because of technological changes, and in particularly in areas like the Appalachians, which are very hard to reach, even if the economy is going ahead at a strong uh, rate. If the tax bill doesn't pass this year, a good many economic inventory uh, developments of the last months, which have helped I think stimulate the economy will of course be disappointed and I think the effect would be very adverse. This is uh, a matter that I would hope we'd have the support of Republicans and Democrats on. I think the argument about whether the country is moving or not will be a discussion next year. I think we can get a better analysis of it after a four-year period. I'll be prepared to say it is. They'll be prepared to say it isn't. <laughs> In Santa Monica, California today, actor Marlon Brando was hospitalized with a high fever resulting from a kidney infection. Mr. Brando, 39 years old, was taken by ambulance from his home to St. John's Hospital this morning, suffering from acute pyelonephritis. This afternoon, Dr. Robert Kosicek stated, quote, Mr. Brando will be hospitalized at least several days, and I'm sure he will not be able to go ahead with his plans to participate in civil rights demonstrations this weekend in Maryland. He is very sick and running a high fever." Unquote. Earlier this week, Mr. Brando and several other Hollywood performers, including Charlton Heston, Tony Curtis, James Garner, and Rita Moreno, held a meeting to discuss plans to attend the civil rights demonstration in Washington on August 28th. Mr. Heston, who led the meeting, read a draft of a formal group statement for the actor's approval. We will march in Washington on August 28, 1963, along with hundreds of thousands of our fellow Americans who believe in equal opportunity and freedom for us all. We will march as citizens because we wish actively to express our support for the civil rights legislation now before the Congress. We will march because we recognize the events of the summer of 1963 as among the most significant we have lived through. We have formed a committee to encourage others to march with us, composed of Marlon Brando, Peter Brown, Tony Curtis, Mel Ferrer, Tony Franciosa, Burt Lancaster, Billy Wilder, so on and so on. Many nays unanimously passed. In the discussion that followed, Mr. Curtis expressed concern about public perceptions of the actor's participation in the march. The way I feel about the civil rights legislation and about this march, I feel as a private citizen and I somehow feel that we do ourselves a disservice by somehow trying to band this together, getting the press to cover it, that some people may misinterpret this as a means for some actors or for some people to want to get publicity. I don't want our participation in this march to hurt it. Mr. Brando responded to Mr. Curtis's concerns. I think that it doesn't matter. People are interested in actors like they're interested in uh, horse racing or uh, auto accidents or fires. The American public spends billions of dollars on trash that they read in the national magazines, the national publications. And if they're capable of inter being interested in that trash, for whatever reason it is, they are interested enough to pause in their daily occupations and think, well, what are all these people doing here? To consider whether it is right or wrong that a Negro should vote, that he should have a decent place to live, that he should be able to send his kids to a good hospital and have a decent job. If we serve that much of a function, then I think that we've served it well. 
Finally, Mr. Heston concurred with Mr. Brando and made some additional points. That's the main point. If you have a public identity, you can't abdicate it. When you take a private action, you get married, you uh, go to Europe, you go to, a, go to the movies, you go to a premiere and people take pictures of you. Obviously, if you go to Washington to support legislation you're in favor of, they're going to take pictures of that too. But I think the main point is we're not doing it as, as public individuals. We're expressing the citizens' rights to peaceable assembly. It's in the Constitution. At a separate meeting last Sunday at the Beverly Hilton, called by the Arts Division of the ACLU, Mr. Brando said he and other movie stars may refuse to work unless there is fair representation of all races in the movie industry. Sports, right after this. Open wide for Chunky. The thickest nickel chocolate bar in the USA. Milk chocolate, raisins, Brazil nuts, cashews. Chunky, extra thick for extra flavor. New, just nuts and milk chocolate. Pecan Chunky. Open wide for Chunky. Chunky. Boxer Floyd Patterson's manager, Customato, said yesterday it would take the greatest fight of the ex-champion's career to beat Sonny Liston Monday night. Liston dethroned Patterson last September by knocking him out in the first round at Chicago's Comiskey Park. Monday's bout, which will take place at Convention Hall in Las Vegas, is scheduled for 15 rounds, but virtually no one believes it will last that long. Liston outweighs Patterson by 20 pounds and has a 13-inch reach advantage. Today, Billy Kahn, who in 1941 gave Joe Lewis one of the toughest fights of his career, expressed no confidence in Patterson, stating, quote, The kid has no chance. Patterson still fights like he did when he was in the amateurs. Sonny can knock him out with his shoelace, unquote. In Las Vegas this week, Liston has radiated ease and confidence. Asked today if he would carry Patterson to give the closed-circuit TV audience around the country their money's worth, Sonny said, quote, Carry him? Yes. Right out. Unquote. This morning, Patterson revealed he had brought his famous fake beard with him to Las Vegas, just in case. It's the same disguise he wore last September when he left Chicago in secrecy. This morning, Floyd said, quote, I don't feel I'll lose, but I have no control over my brain absorbing punches. If I should lose, I'll wear the beard again. I'll do it because I'll be so ashamed." Unquote. In man-to-man -man betting in Las Vegas, it's four to one the beard will make another appearance. And that, for this evening, completes our look at the latest news on this Wednesday, July 17th, 1963. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day tomorrow. This has been your Evening Report, a roundup of the latest news with Joe Rubenstein.